and Jeru. Yes, my lady, my lords. How are you? I'm well, my lords. You have ten minutes. My lord, I'll try to do the best within the time allocated. All right. Uh, my lord, my lady, my lords, uh, permit me to join issues with the earlier submissions made by my by my learned friends, and permit me, my ladies, my lords, to submit that my submissions will majorly deal. Can you join issues on the same side? Join issues? We haven't submitted. What problem do you have with that, Professor Gender? <laughs> my, my, lord, my lord, join issues means he's on the opposing side, but he's supporting the applications as framed. So I don't know whether it is simply a question of not knowing that we haven't spoken, perhaps. <laughs> he's running low on sugar. Uh, my lord, the, the presiding judge, you made an important point that we are Africans. <laughs> I, I think, I think, uh, let Njiru proceed. And he will have his time to speak the right English when his time comes. My ladies, my lords, my submissions will deal with the aspects of public interest in respect to the reason why the court must sustain the conservatory orders as granted by his uh, uh, Justice Mongo and Justice Muita. Your Lordship, permit me to begin by drawing your attention to the dictates of Article 3, which requires every person to uphold and protect the Constitution from being violated. You let, my lady, my lords, the constitution that we are here to protect this afternoon is a document that is progressive in nature and that seeks to protect individuals who either serves in government or out government in whatsoever organ. My lords, in my address, I'll majorly deal with the question of the purported nomination of Professor Kidure Kindiki and whether the lifting of the conservatory orders will culminate into his swearing in and what that means in respect to the provisions of the Constitution. My ladies, my lord, it is clear that a purported process took place in Parliament that culminated into a name being forwarded to Parliament for voting. For, for voting. But ladies, my lords, it is important for us to interrogate the circumstances that led to the forwarding of this name. And whether or not that process is confirmed with the dictates of the Constitution. But ladies, my lords, on the 18th of October, we walked what my learned friend Mr. Ongoya submitted on a memorandum by the President. The said memorandum, my ladies, my lords, indicates that the President sought approval and confirmation from the Independent Electoral and Boundary Commission. And the answer that he got was sufficient enough to afford him the courage to forward the name for voting in Parliament. But the question, my ladies, my lords, that begs an answer is, did the IBC possess the requisite constitutional capacity to submit or and or approve the said name for purposes of voting in Parliament? My ladies, my lords, the answer to that will be found in Article 88, as read together with Article 99 and Article 137 of the Constitution. Article 8, my ladies, my lords, creates the Electoral and Boundary Commission. And in the same article, my ladies, my lords, creates the functions of the said commission. You'll also find the same answer, my ladies, my lords, in the amended IBC Act. Most importantly, Section 10 and Section 11, which I'll be dealing with in the near future. My ladies, my lords, Article 99 as read together with Article 137 provides 
the qualifications for an individual to hold the office of the president and by extension the office of the deputy president. It is important to note, my ladies, my lords, that in the event anything happens that the current president is incapable of executing the functions of office of the president, the purported name if sworn in will, the person, will be the person to take over. But will he have met the necessary requisite qualifications? And who is mandated to ensure that these qualifications are met? We submit, my ladies and my lords, that the only constitutional organ capable of executing that functions is the Independent Electoral and Boundary Commission. The court will take judicial notice, my ladies my lord, that the commission has currently constituted false lack of the commissioners. And the question, therefore, my ladies my lords, in the event the commission is called upon to evaluate the qualifications under Article 99 and Article 139, so that then, my ladies my lords, a name can be submitted in parliament for voting. Who then is capable of doing that in the absence of the commissioners? My ladies my lords, we submit that IBC as currently constituted can only execute administrative functions and it has no capacity or ability to execute the function under Article 99 as read together with Article 137 of the Constitution. Ladies my lords, the constitution as read together with the IVC Act has created distinct functions that for the commissioners and the secretariat. And you'll find that, my ladies my lords, in the decision, consolidated, consolidated petition number 305, which was between engineer Mwaura Kamau, Charity Kilukalukingil versus ESCC. A three-page judge, my ladies, my lords, had that to consider whether the secretariat in the absence of the commissioners can take the functions designated and exclusively allocated to the commissioners. My ladies, my lords, at paragraph 347, this is what the court had to say. From the foregoing provisions, it is clear to us beyond peradventure that the membership of the constitutional commission is between three and nine members. In other words, the, comp the composition of the Constitutional Commission ought not to be less than three and not more than nine. The court goes on to say that if the, if the Secretariat, and in this case the CEO to the IBC, would then be seen to execute the functions of the Commission, it would then mean that the Commissions would go beyond the constitutional dictated number of either three or nine. The court said at paragraph 348, the said members otherwise known as the commissioners are empowered to appoint the commission's chief executive known as the secretary. To, co to contend that the secretary who is an appointee of the commission is part of the commission would mean that the commission would, where commissioners are nine, be composed of membership of ten. The court said, one only needs to mention this to realize how ridiculous this argument is. It is therefore our, our submissions, my ladies, my lords, that the name that was submitted to parliament is not capable of replacing in the event this court dismisses our petition and upholds the impeachment, the deputy president of the Republic of Kenya. The court further said, at paragraph 353, I refer the court to have a look at uh, paragraph 353 and paragraph 354. But of the most importance is what the court said in, uh, relied in the case of petition number 46 of 201. The court relied in a Ugandan case, and this is what the court said. It is clear to us that under the constitution and under the, legis uh, and the legislations, the foundation of the power of a secretariat is the existence of the commission. The secretary and the secretariat can only carry out the powers vested in their offices when the commission is in place, 
exercising its powers since they implement what the Commission has approved or resolved. Again, I urge the court to look at paragraph 356 and also 330, uh, 358. But most importantly, my ladies, my lord, is what the court is saying at paragraph 362. This is what the court had to say. We therefore also agree with the petitioners that any decisions purportedly transmitted to the DPP recommending the prosecution of the petitioners without the sanction of the commission would not be in compliance with the law and the constitution. We urge your, my ladies, my lords, to find that the name that was submitted in parliament is not capable of replacing the deputy president of the Republic of Kenya. Why is that important, my ladies, my lords? Because if the orders are lifted today, that will be the next course of action. My lord, that's not a finding you can make in your ruling on an interlocutory application. Well, it's my, why, my ladies, my lords? Because this is a train with many compartments and many stopovers. The next stopover that we shall land on, my ladies, my lords, if the orders are lifted, is to have a person who has not duly appointed in accordance with the constitution taking over the office of the deputy president. My ladies, my lords, permit me to draw your attention to paragraph 365, 336, and 337 of the same uh, um, judgment. And this will be my final submission in respect to this judgment. At paragraph 367, the court is saying, Whereas a commission may be disabled in its ability to perform its functions, such disability does not automatically render the commission extinct. Such an event, in our view, only places the commission in a state of dormancy until such a time as it is able to carry out its functions. My ladies, my lords, I have perused the replying affidavit filed by Marjan Marjan on behalf of the IBC. He makes no reference to the memorandum filed by the President. <clears throat> my ladies, my lords, he technically makes sure that he does not make reference to that so that he may not be seen as if he has devolved into the functions of another uh, organ. My ladies, my lords, permit me to draw your attention to section 6 of the uh, appointment point, uh, I beg your pardon paragraph 6 of public appointment parliamentary approvals and as you look at paragraph 6 also look at the definitions contained at paragraph 2 of the same act what an appointment means and what a candidate means and for, uh, for avoidance of doubt a candidate means a person who has been proposed or nominated for appointment to a public office. Section 6 creates the criteria upon which Parliament must follow so as to satisfy the need for public participation. It also creates the time within which this must be executed. It has been submitted that this was executed in a supersonic uh, speed that took approximately six hours and the Republic of Kenya had a new deputy president proposed. But the question, my ladies, my lords, is, can this be done in the absence of the uh, um, exercise of the sovereignty of the people of Kenya? If we were to allow this, my ladies, my lords, what will be the import and what will be left of Article 1 of the Constitution? <coughs> will it be to mean that Article 1 of power belonging to, the, the, belonging to the people will be meaningless? Additionally, my ladies, my lords, what will be left of Article 10 of the Constitution that requires state organs to be bowed by the provisions of Article 10 whenever any of them executes the functions bestowed by it by the law? My ladies, my lords, the question of public participation, even in the process of the nomination of the, uh, the, the said candidate, is paramount. That under Article 118, Parliament is enjoined together with Article 10 to carry out public participation. <coughs> and that is the only way, my ladies, my lords, that Parliament can be said to have ex exercised 
the sovereignty of the people of Kenya through the delegated democracy concept. That is to mean, my ladies, my lords, if we were to sanction whatever happened on the 18th and allow it to pass and the consultatory orders are lifted and is sworn in, will have let the people of Kenya down. They will not enjoy the provisions bestowed to, on, upon them by Article 10, Article 1, and Article 118. Article 118 prov uh, creates and dictates that these individuals cannot be left out. Finally, my ladies, my lords, let us look at the question whether we have made out a case that deserves the granting of conservatory orders and one that also deserves the dismissal of the applications by the respondent. My ladies, my lords, the National Assembly Hansons have been brought before you. And I'll draw your attention to page 45 of the said um, Hansons. And most importantly is the submissions that were made by Honorable Mili Othiambo, the Member of Parliament of Suba North. At page 60, uh, 48, she makes observation that public participation had only two... Okay. Do you have uh, the Hansard as part of the affidavit? Yeah, they have been filed. They have been filed? Yes, yes, my lady. Where do we find them? Is it part of the application? It's part of the petition, my lords. That is 522, the Hansons. Part of the application or part of the petition? Petition. Yes, then that's, that, I mean, that is something different. We are dealing with the application. But most importantly, my ladies, my lords, it went on Hansons that only 200,000 people purportedly participated in that process. That is to me, my ladies, my ladies, my lords, for Honorable Mutuse to have the guts and the audacity to move the motion, he had the backing of 200,000 people as against a population of 50 million Kenyans or as against the population of over 14 million registered voters. What begs question for determination was that a qualitative and a quantitative public participation was it meritocracy does it deserve the or could it convince that public participation that was adequate was conducted before the motion was moved my ladies my lords to afford us an opportunity to bring this case out we beseech you my ladies my lords that you sustain and uh, uh, allow the conserv uh, conservatory orders sought and dismiss the application by the respondents. Finally, my ladies, my lords, I invite you to look at the submissions filed by the Attorney General in support of the application. Of most importance, my ladies, my lords, the Attorney General at page 6 of her submissions invites you to look at a conservatory order sorry not page six my ladies that is page page five as as one that is meant to maintain the status quo and she tells you my ladies my lords that the status quo to be, to be preserved is a status quo ante that is to mean that the status quo that the court needs to preserve is the approval and the voting of Mr. Kindiki. That is according to her the status quo that she needs to be preserved. And she makes out a case that the conservatory order needs to be set, uh, to be set aside so that that, that status quo can be sustained. There can never be anything that is far from the truth, my ladies, my lords. The orders of Justice Mongo stayed each and every aspect that took place, including the implementation of the resolution by parliament to consider the first petitioner as impeached. She further tells you in her submissions that conservatory orders are only capable of being granted under Article 23 of the Constitution. And she argues that Article 23 only relates to the Bill of Rights. And then she further argues that if the petition is not premised 
on violation or infringement or denial of a human right, then conservatory orders, according to her, are not capable of being granted by the court. But my ladies, my lords, we have put up a case that a right to a fair hearing was denied. We have put up a case that the Senate of the Republic of Kenya decided to abrogate Article 25 of the Constitution. If that is not a question that relates to a Bill of Rights, what then does it relate to? Further to that, my ladies, my lords, under Article 258 of the Constitution, to which we are saying that the Constitution has been abrogated and violated by the respondents, what remedy can the court issue in the circumstances that a case is brought out that the Constitution has been abrogated and violated by the respondents? if it's not a conservatory order. My ladies, my lords, finally, as I pen off, I invite you to look at the principles of public interest. It is in the public interest, my ladies, my lords, that these orders be sustained so that the Republic of Kenya can have the opportunity of the court pronouncing itself whether their democratically elected deputy president was justifiably removed and lawfully removed from office. That is to mean, your ladies, my lords, that under Article 38 of the Constitution, the people who supported the deputy president have a legitimate expectation. A legitimate expectation that their deputy president as elected will be subjected to a proper and accountable and transparent mechanism of removal. They also have a, legit a legitimate expectation that if any organ constituted by the Constitution does fail to abide by the dictates of the Constitution, that this court will uphold that position and that this court will set aside the impeachment. And the consequences of that, my ladies, my lords, is that if this court is convinced by our argument to set aside the impeachment, the question will then be that the deputy president will assume office. Number two, my ladies, my lords, you will be urged to set aside the conservatory orders on the basis that there is constitutional crisis that is looming. But who has precipitated and created this constitutional crisis if it does exist, if not the respondents? If they followed the law to the letter, and we, so satisfied, we feel satisfied that our client was justifiably removed from office, we would not be before you, my ladies, my lords. We would have taken an ample pie and go home. But we are here before you, my ladies, my lords, because the situation has been precipitated and created by the respondents. Finally, my ladies, my lords, if the respondents are the ones who are at fault, do they deserve your mercy? What is the position of equity if they come to you with dirty hands? Do they deserve your mercy? He who comes to equity must come with clean hands. They are the transgressors and the violators of the Constitution. And therefore, my ladies and my lords, they cannot come before you as though they are saints. I so urge you, my ladies and my lords, to dismiss that application and uphold the application for the maintenance or for the retaining of the conservatory orders. I am most humbled. Thank you. You are for? My, my Lord, I appear for the ninth petitioner. You will have five minutes. Uh, my Lord, presiding judge, my Lord and my ladies, if it pleases you and in keeping with the notices affixed to the walls of this wall, permit me to reintroduce myself. My name is Wamboy, Shadrach Wamboy. I appear